So welcome to BCTLA 23 session called Tools to Help Students to Decipher Online AI and Misinformation Disinformation Using Lateral Reading Strategies and Recognition of Bias Vulnerabilities. My name is Kathy Miller. I was a BC teacher for 35 years, 29 years full-time, grades 4 to 12 in my career. I have a master's in curriculum from uh, UVic. And uh, I support school-based initiatives such as Kids Boost Immunity. Uh, I'm speaking from the unceded territories of the Comox people in the Comox Valley on Vancouver Island. Kids Boost Immunity is, uh, was started out of BC. It's funded by the Ministry of Health. Uh, so we work primarily with BC teachers. There are over 1,500 BC teachers currently using Kids Boost Immunity or know about it. And... Um, it's very likely a teacher in your school is new, using it or knows about it. In this session, you're going to see lessons and support materials specific to the topic of misinformation that are part of many lessons and resources on Kids Boost Immunity. It's free, it's only for teachers, and it has been an approved provincial resource in BC since 2018. We've recently had another evaluation from focused resources for the Indigenous governance lessons that we have uh, made by Indigenous educators in case your teachers in your school are interested in that as well. In this session, you're gonna see lessons and support materials specific to this topic of misinformation that are part of many lessons. And, uh, Kids Boost Immunity is made by teachers, for teachers, and health experts where relevant, as is the case with our new lessons, which will be presented by their creator today, Takudo Shioda. Tak and I have worked uh, on Kids Boost Immunity for six years, so I know him very well, and I know the quality of uh, materials and lessons that he has created and the incredible um, uh, brilliance he brings for many things. Anyone that's a curriculum consultant that has met TAC has said, you should be a teacher. So I think you will appreciate um, the lessons that are there. Um, they're the first of their kind in the world and TAC knows this because he, he works at the global level on this issue. Uh, the lessons presented today are for grades six to 12. If four or five are needed and you feel that, please let us know. We always respond to what teachers are needing and asking for. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to send them in the chat and one of us will answer during the presentation. We ask that you keep your mics muted during the presentation to avoid distractions, but you are welcome to unmute yourselves and ask questions directly at the end if you'd like. And over to you, Tac, uh, to introduce yourself and and show the lessons. Sure. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, so hello, everybody. Um, I guess I'll just get started with, uh, so I run my own communications company. Uh, it's called Shoda Health Communications, and we provide services to, um, well, the Public Health Association of BC, which is what I work with Kathy on, uh, as well as the World Health Organization and the Pan American Health Organization right now. Um, so yes, global, like Kathy said. Uh, and I work um, primarily on strategies and sort of tactics to uh, around uh, misinformation, um, as well as media monitoring and things like that. And so the lessons, these lessons have actually been created. Um, a lot of it has to do with practical things that I actually teach uh, my employees uh, about how to stay safe um, and how to recognize, um, you know, different uh, misinformation and where you, you personally might be vulnerable and what to look out for and things like that. So it's basically taking a lot of those lessons learned and turning into a lesson. Um, so without any further ado, I'll get straight to it. Um, I need to share. Hold on. Let me see. Go. Oops. Um, I think you're seeing the right screen. Yeah, okay. So this lesson section is called uh, Navigating the World of Online Information. The version I'm showing you today is eight, grade eight and up. Although like Kathy said, there is a six, seven version as well. Um, and this is just one part of Kids Boost Immunity, which um, Kathy will go over later. Um, 
So I won't go into the details of how the site works on this, on the, my part of this presentation. Uh, so there's actually six lessons and um, each one sort of serves a different purpose. And I'm just going to go over them um, really quickly in terms of what, how they're organized and why, and sort of some of the intent behind it, as well as uh, the learnings that we, the students will take away. Uh, so the first one lesson is called uh, DHMO, the silent threat. Uh, now, many of you might know DHMO is actually a, another way of writing um, dihydrogen monoxide, which is another way of saying H2O, and so just water. Uh, but it's actually, there's a hoax that's sort of existed for many years now, uh, where people try to um, get other people scared about DHMO because you know, it's very easy to make it sound scary. So, you know, this is all true. And we sort of start with the story that uh, there's a chemical substance that kills thousands of people. You know, you can't, if you breathe even a little bit, it could suffocate you. Um, touching it could cause burns. Um, it's in cancer cells, you know, things like that. Um, and, you know, we ask basically the students to start with just to, uh, basically uh, this part where, you know, do you think it should be banned given all these things that we tell you? Um, so I'm just going to select no for the time being. So a lot of Kids Boost is actually very interactive. Um, and again, Kathy will go over that. But um, and so we kind of then in the next part explain how easy it is to sort of make even something simple as water sound really scary. And the fact that it's adults get fooled all the time. And here you can see we give them an example from The Guardian where uh, a California city council tried to ban it um, because they. Yeah. And then so at some point someone stepped in and said, this doesn't make any sense. But the idea is that even adults and even adults in power can be fooled by something as silly as this, if you will. Um, and the idea is that yeah, everyone's kind of vulnerable and we're trying to sort of open up that um, <clears throat> awareness because I think one of the primary reasons people are vulnerable because they don't think they're vulnerable. And one of the things we try to go over in this lesson section uh, is to sort of really get that across that um, everyone's vulnerable. And also there's nothing wrong necessarily with getting misled. Um, it shouldn't count as a value judgment about your intelligence and things like that. Um, so that, you know, because I think a lot of the trouble comes from uh, people having a really defensive position about these things. So um, it's sort of setting up basically the way that, you know, I've talked about it with Kathy is that we're trying to set up sort of a healthy relationship with what information is, especially online and sort of that landscape of what it is like to actually consume. Um, information online, whether it's true or not. Um, and so next we sort of give them a definition of what misinformation is and that doesn't really matter for now. Uh, and then it has a quiz, it's interactive as well. I'm, I'm not really gonna go over how this works again. I'm gonna let Kathy do that because uh, this isn't as vital to this lesson section as some other lessons um, in, on Kids Boost. Um, lesson two is how do we know things about the world again so going back to what i just said about having a healthy relationship with what knowledge itself is and information and sort of your relationship to it um one of the main things that makes people vulnerable to um misinformation is and actually another way to put it is one of the reasons why misinformation spreads so easily and becomes so believable is it takes advantage of you know obviously people not knowing very much about a specific topic, but also um, they have the advantage of making something really complex sound very simplistic. And in fact, um, all misinformation more or less is a simplistic version of a much more complex reality. Um, and so the idea behind this lesson is to get the students to start to understand the complexity behind everything, like knowing about anything basically is a lot more complex than most people assume um, or a, regularly think about. And so we are trying to set it up in a certain way that um, students can sort of experientially sort of recognize that. So we start with a interactive sort of um, activity here where we ask them to, you know, imagine a pencil and think about what it would be like to invent a pencil say a couple hundred years ago when invent pencils didn't exist you know what would you need to do if you time traveled right and then you click on different areas of that and you can see okay the pencil head right what is it made of what equipment do you need what ingredients is it um you know this middle part the wood part itself like what kind of wood is it does it need to be treated treated a certain way right how do you make the wood that it's in, in that certain shape um obviously there's the paint and this i think that's, you know, that, that's its own sort of expertise. Uh, there's metallurgy involved in the metal parts and obviously chemistry involved in the, uh, in the eraser parts. Um, the idea being that even something as simple as this, let alone something as complex as like say a, a cell phone, 
um, has so much expertise behind it and so much complexity behind it that no one can, no single person can really do these things on their own. And that's the case with pretty much any object that's human made. Um, obviously there are some exceptions, but, um, <clears throat> And so the idea is that we're trying to promote this idea that knowledge is actually a communal. It's not something that's, you know, one of the problems with, again, misinformation and sort of fact checking. And in a lot of these lessons, um, th this lesson section is trying to address essentially the shortcomings of our current uh, critical thinking uh, lessons and what we teach. Because I think everyone on this call will probably recognize that the kinds of things we teach uh, students when it comes to critical thinking is no different than probably what you learned in your elementary school years. Um, and those were different, that was a different era, right? Um, a lot of those were designed for a time and the purpose of, you know, go to a library, do a research project, here's what you need to know, here's how you should check sources, you know. And again, those things are very important. Fact checking is important. But the reality, again, this starts with a different sort of goal here. The reality is that no one has time to fact check everything. And if we're expecting students to just learn how to fact check and make that be the only thing they have in terms of getting making sure they're protected from misinformation is just unrealistic um especially and i'll talk about this later if you consider things like TikTok, where there's a new fact being sent to you every 10 15 seconds i mean no one no one is fact checking those things um and so you know you just start consuming those things and so how do we again, set up the relationship and understanding of knowledge in a way that is a little bit more protective, even when they see those things. So again, the idea here is then to think about knowledge as a communal thing. Um, so, you know, we're kind of first setting up that uh, one, you might not actually even be able to fact check by yourself. You might not even know the expertise uh, to, to even do that properly um, because that's how complex things are. Um, and we sort of give a math example here where again, you know, if there's a complex math equation, you know, unless you have that expertise, you're not gonna even know what's wrong with that equation. And I think that's a pretty easy understand, example to understand. Um, and then we sort of move into the fact that uh, everyone has an important role because it is communal. You know, what you decide to share, what you decide to believe, all those things matter and it kind of contributes to this community. And so you need to be kind of responsible and careful about what you do as well is the idea here. Um, and then after that, we kind of get into another kind of activity. And this comes with actually a whole worksheet and a, um, um, a teacher's guide on how to sort of do this. Um, and again, Kathy will go over that. But the idea is we ask students to basically do the same thing we just did with the pencil example, but choose another object, a simple object, um, and sort of list sort of the expertise required, you know, the knowledge required and things like that. And then part two of this is then to compare it with your classmates. And the idea being that it should be, no matter what you choose, generally speaking, there should be some overlap with some kind of expertise um, and some kind of knowledge with someone else. And so it should become viscerally obvious how, oh, the expertise required with this object is tied with that object and that object and this object. And everything's kind of connected in some way. And so, again, misinformation tends to spread because it tries to sort of put in doubts about some specific topic or specific knowledge or a specific object. Um, and sort of really hammers it. But when, if you think of knowledge in this way, it's a little bit more, uh, it's a little less vulnerable because you start to understand, well, if that's the case, then, you know, then all these objects that rely on the same expertise, and if they're wrong, then all these start to not make sense. Like the whole thing starts to fall apart, um, which I should point out is what happens when you end up sort of going really deep and you start believing conspiracies and you have an entirely different understanding of reality. And so, again, this is trying to protect people from going that direction. Um, and so in that vein, we sort of uh, characterize this a little bit differently in that misinformation itself is not just like wrong information or rumor. It actually threatens what knowledge itself is because it takes it away from how knowledge is actually um, constituted, which is communal. And so then we give them a few um, pointers of things to look out for you know what what kind of markers show to show you that oh you know maybe you, i should take a second before believing this um and then we can sort of go into again uh, this is, takes a different approach so now that you know what knowledge is we sort of go into explaining how 
the internet itself is actually very conducive to make it easy to believe in misinformation. And so the rest of the lesson is mostly around these sorts of this sort of knowledge about um, it, it's very similar to how I think most of us at some point learned how to be better at media literacy, especially around ads. Uh, you might see an ad and it claims this does whatever. Um, you know, your instinct shouldn't be, oh, that's probably true or whatever it is. And but we don't we haven't quite developed for internet content. Um, we might have that instinct when it comes to statements of fact on the internet but as you'll see in the next few lessons that's not the only way that things um, are conveyed as true and so again i'll get that in a bit more detail but we start with sort of explaining the basics of how the internet itself um, and what you're shown is tailored to you and so that's why it's very easy to believe in misinformation um, and so again, we, we first start with how internet relies on ads, and this is why it'll show you things that you've already clicked on more. So, and I, I know everyone here have experienced that. Um, so the idea being that if you want to start going down one road, if you Google something that's um, particularly, uh, say, a piece of misinformation, um, you'll get more of that and more content from people who believe the same thing. So you'll end up thinking and believing that, oh, most people might believe this when in fact it might be a very small um, minority. And so we, again, we give an example here, right? you could Google something and the results will be different depending on who you are. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so again, like kind of explaining how this affects uh, your what you see on the internet and misinformation and the fact that you'll see more the more you consume it. So you need to sort of really be careful fairly early on. Uh, lesson three is called Learn to Critically Ignore. This is based on some work from um, some MIT profs who wrote a recent um, paper slash article. Um, and sort of we're kind of rejigging this a little bit for our needs. But um, it's called Critical Ignoring. And the idea is that, again, if you start getting really curious about things that are wrong, you'll start seeing more of that. And your feed is going to look more like that. And then you're going to start believing that the world is actually all of that. And it's not the case. And so you need to really sort of hone in and be careful of what you're looking at fairly early. And so the idea here is that, uh, you know, here are some tips on how to do that. And I won't spend too much time on this, but self nudging, um, again, lateral reading, there's a whole section on this that Kathy will go over. This is just sort of mentioning it again in this. Um, you know, research claims made, don't feed the trolls. And I'm not going to get into this too much. Um, notice when someone's telling you a fact, right? A lot of people don't even notice that they're being told something. So again, sort of teaching about that. And then we spend a bit more time on TikTok itself because again, um, what I said earlier in that um, there's even a risk in the platform and the kinds of ways that you consume uh, misinformation. And that again, if you, I'm sure most of you have seen, whether it's on TikTok or Facebook or wherever, there's a lot of fast facts sort of content. Like, did you know this? Or like, you know, in history, this happened or you know, whatever it is. And those aren't fact checked by people who will consume it very often. And if you start getting used to consuming that content and believing, it, uh, you'll be really vulnerable. So you should really uh, question, you know, whether these are the places you should be consuming those things and um, at the very least be aware. Um, and then lesson four, this is where I'm going to spend the most of today in four and five. Um, so we switch to teaching students uh, the tactics that make information feel true. And by this, I don't mean like whether they're actually true, but information that feels true. And that those are very different things. And I don't think we make enough of a distinction of those things, that, that things can feel true even if they're wrong or false. And so there's a lot of tactics that um, misinformation adv advocates, that's the wrong word, <laughs> spreaders use to um, um, make whatever they're saying feel more true. Um, and so I'm just going to go over a bunch of these, but uh, one number one is beware of influencers. Again, the idea being that often fame itself makes feel, makes it feel like what, you know, famous people saying something makes it feel like it's more true than, you know, some random person on the street. Um, so we should be careful like that. That's pretty obvious, obviously, when I say it. Um, and again, some stuff about, um, you know, clickbaity headlines that are a bit more emotional and things like that. Um, and again, we need to talk about their favorite influencers, no matter how much you feel like you know them, you don't actually do. Um, and then for this section, there are actually, um, you can see it's several parts and we actually broke them up because we really wanted them to, uh, the students to really sit with these each time. Um, the second is pretending to be experts. And, you know, the obvious one of this is things like, and we mentioned that, you know, they might dress like a doctor, they're not. That's really obvious, but the more complex things, and there's a lot of these sorts of examples, is the second one where we talk about there's actually a growing popularity in um, 
fake podcasts. And by that, I mean, it'll be content like this that looks like Instagram or, you know, um, TikTok, uh, where they have a mic in front of them and they're looking off to the side and they talk as if it's like a clip from a podcast, like a longer podcast. But that podcast actually doesn't exist. And the idea here is that you present yourself this way, you seem a little bit more legitimate, like you've actually done some research, you have an expert on the other side. Um, you know, you come across more like a journalist rather than someone just talking into a camera. It's these sorts of things that I mean when I talk about what does mean information, what, what do you do to make information feel more true? And so a lot, the rest of the lesson you'll see, and especially the interactive parts, this is the kind of stuff that we're really trying to emphasize. We can't teach everything, but the idea is that you should look for certain things. You should be careful of certain parts that might be manipulated. And so you'll see that's sort of what we get into. Um, let's see. Uh, so comment sections, this is a big one. Uh, there's a lot of studies that show that um, people rely on comment sections more so than the actual article itself to determine if it's worth considering or if it's true. Um, people seem to think that the comment section is a good place to determine if it's worth believing. So, um, and I get it, right? Um, that's what reviews are, for example, or Yelp, um, you know, things like that. But the idea here is that we're trying to teach them that actually it's very manipulable and it often is. So you need to be very careful. So this is where we start to get into back into a bit more of the um, interactive stuff. So we point out this is, you know, you, you can we get them to click around these sort of different aspects that can be manipulated and how. So again, the number of comments can be manipulated. You can buy those. Same thing with this, the likes, right? This might seem like a worthwhile um, comment, but it, you know, you could buy those. You could be faked. Um, this part. Uh, sometimes the account age, right? You might see an account, especially on forums. Oh, this person's been posting for ten years about this issue. Maybe they know what they're talking about. That's not necessarily true. You can buy accounts for one thing. There's all sorts of ways of manipulating that. Again, you could be a fake doctor. Uh, so it's are kind of obvious. Um, and testimonials. So I won't get into too much detail about this, but this is basically we look into a little bit deeper on Amazon, for example, um, and we look into a lawsuit that actually Amazon was involved in around fake reviews. And we take some well, actually take some screenshots from the actual lawsuit, which you can see is things like, oh, okay, you can buy you can buy reviews on this too, including um, things that look like they're written by people, including verified reviews. Like those can be bought very cheaply. Um, again, the number of reviews you could buy those. If there's photos, you can buy those too. Like all of this can be manipulated, so don't take it at face value, basically. Um, and then we get into AI, where basically, this is the reason why we get into AI here is because AI has basically made everything I've mentioned so far much easier to do, much cheaper to do, and much faster to do. So what you know, whether you can tell if something is AI or not, um, that's going to be again, increasingly difficult. So what we ended up, instead of sort of teaching tips on how to recognize it, um, it's going to be out of date very quickly. We'd, it makes more sense to sort of get people to pay attention to where AI will be manipulating. Right, so the th kinds of things I've mentioned so far. Um, so we talk about this photo, which some of you may recognize. It went viral. It's actually fake. Um, the Pope is not um, wearing this actual thing. Um, yeah, uh, and then we actually go into a little bit of this. This this is an excellent uh, video um, that BBC made. Um, I won't play through the whole thing, but it's basically they're in a classroom and they ask a bunch of students and they do a little bit of an experiment of sorts where they show them a piece of misinformation and see much, how much they believe and you know why and things like that. And it's a really great um, video, e even for students to see um, at um, how easy it is to believe things that are um, AI generated. Um, and let's see. Um, yeah, so that's lesson four. And then lesson five, um, now we sort of turn this and say, okay, now we've taught you a few things, you know, try to practice identifying these features. And so uh, we turn into a much more interactive section here um, where we give them, you know, real examples. Although some of them are, we made just so that we can illustrate the point um, where a piece of misinformation, you know, is out there and how do you, which part should you be recognized? Which part's being manipulated? So it sounds, again, sounds and feels true, right? So the idea here is that you click on different sections of this to see you know, if it's been manipulated. So in this case, no, but we do explain that it could be manipulated in one way or another. Um, so in this example, um, again, it's not the date, it's not the, not, these aren't been manipulated. The part that's manipulated is, um, so again, this is an actual real example where there was a bit of a scandal because um, Biden said that people should get vaccinated because there's a hurricane coming. Um, 
but the full quote's actually that because there's a hurricane coming and everyone needs to go to the shelter, this is in the middle of COVID, by the way, um, everyone should get vaccinated, right? Like that makes sense. So the idea here is, again, you can manipulate um, parts of a code um, to make it sound um, essentially miscode people. And then each of these sections has a little bit more of a description of what's happening here. Um, again, I won't go over this right now, but um, in the next example, uh, similarly, this is an Instagram post. Uh, you could click on, you know, the name could be manipulated, the location could be manipulated, um, and so on and so forth. In this case, it's a little bit of a different one because we it's actually the filter itself. Uh, we call that out. Um, and I know students will be aware of this, but I think it's important to students to know that this is, in a essence, a similar form to misinformation because it changes your expectation and understanding of what say in this case, what a realistic human body looks like um, and what you should therefore do about it, right? It, it's it's very much creating a vulnerability in um, the student population in terms of, you know, what, well, I'm sure I don't have to explain any of that body image things to you. Um, so the idea is that that is also a form of inflation that um, changes the nature of how you think about, you know, basic facts about um, humans. And so, you know, we, again, we get into this a little bit more. Um, and this one, again, similar. Uh, this is a real example where there was a climate change protest in Hyde Park in New York. Um, and this post was saying, oh, the protesters left all this garbage, they're hypocrites. Uh, and then we sort of, again, same thing, what part of this is actually manipulated? And it's not the location, it's Hyde Park. It did really happen. There was a protest that day. The only thing is that this is actually, um, actually, I'm not sure where we put this. It might actually been here. Yeah. Which one is it? Ah, this one, yeah. Um, and so what's actually happened, and what we explained down here, is that um, this is actually a different part of a photo. There was like a concert-ish or something. I can't remember the exact details happening at the same time. Um, and this photo is from that part of the park, not the protest part of the park. Um, and oh, yeah. Okay, so this one's a really good one as well. Um, same idea. You might see something like this online. Um, you know, pretty much everything about this is manipulated. And the reason why that is, is because this is entirely AI generated. None of this was written. We actually have a whole article that we made um, and it took, I don't know, 30 seconds. This uh, this image is fake. Um, we, you know, we tried to give it a, uh, a title that students might find particularly appealing if it was true, um, but it's not. Uh, and we also point out that breaking news is a really vulnerable state as well, because um, for one, often things that are breaking news is not breaking news. Um, and then two, when it comes to breaking news, even adults often sort of let down their guard in terms of what is uh, worth fact checking or not. Um, and uh, so we sort of bring attention to that. Um, and then this next section, I'll just go through. This is just uh, that this graph isn't scaled properly, right? You can see one is here and 13 is here. Um, <clears throat> and then this one is, oh yeah, so this is, you know, those fast facts things like I mentioned earlier. Uh, you might see these sorts of things a lot in Instagram and things like that. So um, again, just sort of calling out that, um, you know, for in this case, frankly, anything could have been manipulated. Um, and then I think, yeah, and then we start the quiz. And then six, you might think that now, <laughs> now all we've done is just say, don't trust anything. And in some ways that's kind of true, but the idea is more so, you know, like I said earlier, we can't expect everyone to fact check everything. But I think uh, same thing with ads. It's not like once you're ad savvy, if you will, you, you can consume ads and not be swayed by them as easily, right? And the idea here is to sort of build that resilience. And so number six is sort of teaching sort of some skills around that. Um, and again, these are the kinds of things that I teach my employees um, to pay attention to and things like that. Um, so the first part is um, pay attention to how you feel. The biggest marker of whether you're currently vulnerable to misinformation is if you read something or listen to something or whatever it is, and you feel something, right? Whether it's happy, sad, angry, surprise, right? If you're feeling those things, that means you're taking it at face value and you need to pause right there and consider again, wait, is this even true, right? And so, you know, obviously this is gonna take practice, um, but the idea is that you should at least know this tactic and sort of think about sort of things that, you know, think about these sorts of things, like which part of it could be manipulating. Um, and for people who are more self-aware, you know, I would even encourage, be aware of your specific things. Like what are the patterns of kinds of things that make me sort of immediately go, whoa, or you know, get angry when I read it, you know? Uh, the people who write these things know what they're doing. And so 
yeah, um, if you can sort of be that self-aware, that'd be ideal. But, and then secondly, this is when you should, again, do things like the trap test or the trap test or basically in lateral reading, all the kinds of normal um, critical thinking sort of skills that we do teach earlier than this. Um, and then again, remember that knowledge is a web. So what you've just read, how does this fit with everything else that you know, right? In terms of, um, again, expertise and things like that, does this make sense? And again, we sort of talk about, um, you know, some of the points that you should look out for. Um, yeah, and then the source is down here. And then that's basically the uh, entire section. Um, yeah, uh, I guess at that point, um, I'll throw it back to you, Kathy. Thanks so much, Tak. Uh, that's amazing. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I am going to uh, share the, um, the other parts that come along with the lesson. So I am here on navigating the world of online information and I will talk more about the program uh, soon. Um, and first of all, if you have any questions for TAC, if you could um, perhaps uh, ask those now, I think, I believe TAC, you're gonna be heading off now, is that correct? Oh, actually, I think I'm gonna be okay. So okay, perfect. I can wait till the end. Yeah. Okay, good. So um, there is a something in the chat if you want to check that tack. And is that a question for you? First. Oh, oh no, it's just a comment. So okay, me. okay, <laughs> thanks. Uh, so I won't share that with everybody. But so what I I'm on Kids Boost Immunity. I'm a teacher. I'm logged in, and I've gone to these lessons. I'll talk more about the program uh, later. We're just going to focus on the misinformation lessons right now. And what you can see here, they're all listed there. Uh, TAC went through each one, but this is how you would see it as a teacher and choose which ones you're going to do. Uh, on each lesson, you can go to view unit lesson plan. And what we have here is, uh, do I have the map card? I believe I do. Um, here it is. So I have clicked on that. I have it open in Google. It's an adaptable a file for you to download. There are links to individual lessons and there are um, also links with the lessons, there are links to actual um, forms and inquiry. I will say whether it's an inquiry activity, whether it's a literacy building activity. And here there, it says, note, there are three versions of the same activity related to identifying communal types of expertise, knowledge, and you can go and see what each of them are there. So that is tied to the pencil uh, of, you know, how many different experts does it take to make an object? And um, I can open one for you here. And oops. so this one you can see on the side, it tells you what to do. And it, it says, here are some ideas for what state stages might include. Um, and, and it has a whole project there for, for this activity, you will need to work in pairs or a group without telling the others what you're thinking about. Each of you needs to choose an object or item, might be something you recently acquired or related to something you really enjoy, like music, sports, food, bikes, cars, or things you do around home. And then they are led through it. There's a chart there and um, then a reflective activity. So the, um, the diff they're designed to be age appropriate. Um, here, I think you'll be, uh, this is made by a teacher that, uh, can we, can everyone see that? Tack, can you see it? Yep, I can see it. Okay, perfect. Uh, so this was designed by a teacher um, uh, who is an ELA teacher and it is navigating the world of online information tactics that make information feel true, digital advertising techniques and case studies activity. So there's vocabulary, is my vote cell phone listening to me? And it takes uh, into an actual activity that they, they can fill in, uh, targeted advertising, retargeted remarketing, and they respond, I've seen an ad like this before. So they're they're getting a chance to reflect on and actually apply what they've learned in an activity. Uh, so, and 
and it it's very thorough. I'm just scrolling through so you can see. And uh, and then there are case studies and case study one. Anna loves online shopping, subscribes to numerous newsletters for various online retailers. One morning she opens her email, finds a message from one of her favorite clothing brands. So it, it is designed for this age and they go and respond to that. Uh, so now back to here, the, you can see there are different um, activities for each of the lessons. And this one is based on the um, BBC um, example of, uh, that was about aliens um, from 5,000 years ago created the pyramids to generate electricity. And this one is where they are shown different emotional reactions that they can have. And then they're given a number of headlines uh, that they're going to pick a few and choose two titles from the list of headlines that catch your attention and complete the activity below. Explain the way the headline catches your attention. Would you be likely to click on this news post? Explain why or why not? So um, that is for the navigating the world of online information uh, eight, to eight to 12. We have lessons for six to seven as well. And I will show you the one lesson just to show you how it is different to the, um, the older age. So we have vocabulary and literacy building um, worksheets to go along with it. And to explain some of the things that they are reading in the lesson, it still includes the pencil example. Uh, and there is a visual to help them understand the communal knowledge is a communal web. So it is taken down in the eight to be age appropriate. And here is an example of an interactive uh, activity that we have on on Kids Boost. So uh, guess how many uh, there's a lot of information out there. See if you know how much guess how many books exist in the world and how long it would take to read them. So they make a guess. Oops, not quite right. And they go again. You are correct. To read all the books that exist, you would have to read 5,000 books every day for 79 years. And then it, is, it goes on to a next one. So there are ways for them to interact online that make it engaging and help processing. So, uh, so those, um, there's three lessons um, for this this um, misinformation section and it's called navigating the world of online information is is um, what it's called i'm now going to take you to uh, the um, critical thinking lessons and in the critical thinking lessons what has been added is one on lateral reading so um the, there are a whole bunch of lessons in the critical thinking. I can show you the uh, critical thinking unit plan for this. So there are power of the story, how to collect trustworthy information, primary and secondary sources. And then this one has been now introduced into this group of lessons, uh, uh, lateral reading. And then there's thinking critically about information, beware of bias, and how to test ideas by creating experiments. Then thinking critically about experiments, correlation versus causation, sorry. Uh, so this is a whole learning module. And the um, lateral reading for eight, nine is this one. So the way that we did this is exactly what Tack was saying about, oh, when you go online, uh, you know, you're going to pause when you see something that you now know to be to question. There's a video on what is lateral reading that is, um, and there's audio with with the lessons as well. Then it explains what most of us use vertical reading. Um, lateral reading is very different and explains the difference between the two that with lateral reading, instead of reading one article from top to bottom, lateral reading encourages you to stop reading as soon as you know the general topic, the claims being made and the people behind the article. Then open several tabs and look for information about the topic. So this is for grades eight, nine. And uh, we uh, write it so um, you 
are they provided with questions that they can put into their searches? We describe the, the SIF technique where they stop and there are actually um, videos that go along with this uh, by the author and the, the developers of the SIF technique and that, can, that they can also watch. And uh, it explains, so they stop, um, they um, investigate, And so it describes a little bit about that. And then they find a must, uh, that's where they open the tabs and they find trusted coverage on the topic. And so it gives examples of some trusted sites that they can go and actually see if there's anything about the author or the organization there. And then, and with each of these learn more, there is a video with it. And then they trace the claims and quotes and medias back to the original context and figure out if they are coming from reputable sources. And again, there is the video. Um, so then there's an actual uh, concrete example for them. So lateral reading example one is from MediaWise PBS. We got permission from them to share this. We do not put links out of the site because we want to keep students into the KBI site. So it's there if they, they want to go and see it on the site to copy and paste in a new tab. And it talks about how sensational claims can spread misleading information. And here there is um, a tool to help them find out more about this. Uh, in this example, MediaWise fact checker Isaac, age 17, checks out a TikTok video report by Dylan Page suggesting that Africa may be in danger of splitting. Dylan has over 2 million likes and a big following and clearly knows that sensationalism can gain an audience, but how credible is it? So it explains what the first thing Isaac did was stop and started doing some fact checking. Uh, Dylan's page claims to be the number one news reporter on TikTok. Isaac couldn't find any authentication of Dylan Page being a journalist or news or with a news outlet. So that makes author credibility unreliable. And then find. Um, so Isaac did a keyword search on the topic of Africa splitting apart. So it talks about that. The first sites were not recognizable. Explain scroll down till you find some that you can feel are credible. I clicked on an uh, image from USA Today and learned that uh, from 2018, learned that a large crack in the ground in Western Kenya caused people to worry about Africa splitting apart. But in fact, it will take millions of years. Uh, Isaac did say that was mostly legit uh, in that there is evidence that Africa may be splitting apart, but they failed to mention that this will take millions of years. So that's one example uh, for the students to see. Uh, then there's a video on uh, where lateral reading was developed out of the Stan Stanford History Education Group to explain that and how college students and professors read vertically. And in a challenge, they were deceived by the looks of the a website. Uh, they were deceived by official looking logos and official and sounding domain names, whereas professional fact checkers read laterally and they check as they read in new browser searches for related news articles and who made the information. In this little reading example too, um, this one is from the P librarians at Piedmont Virginia Community College. And this is um, a source from the Heartland Institute Research and Commentary. US transition to 100% renewable energy would lead to cat catastrophe. So is it a good article? And so in, in their site, they suggest step one, Google the Heartland in Institute and it, it will help you find out that it describes itself as a national nonprofit research education organization. Um, and it sounds legit. However, there's a big difference between that one and what Wikipedia says. And Wikipedia says it's a conservative libertarian public policy think tank organization that focuses on, and it goes on to say that they're actually have worked to discredit the risks of secondhand smoke and our climate change deniers. So it is not a reliable source. And it goes on to talk about the author. So this is a very um, full lesson with examples. I will show you the um, six, seven version, uh, which is 
a lower reading level. So again, we have the vocabulary in the unit plan that comes along with this. There are worksheets and uh, that go along with this to support uh, students with knowing those uh, vocabulary. And this one con concentrates on the SIF technique. So it says use the SIF technique in, in uh, lateral reading. So it explains what it is. And then, so again, it's stop, investigate, trace, uh, find and trace. And then it goes, it presents Isaac again in a fuller uh, way here. And at the end of each lesson, there is a quiz with Kids Boost Immunity. What the students do when they go on a quiz is that they are given questions and it tells how many. And when they complete the, the quizzes, um, they are, if they score 80% or higher, uh, they can earn vaccines uh, for children around the world in need uh, that is distributed through UNICEF. So that is why the name Kids Boost Immunity is that this tying learning to the chance to do good for others uh, through in, in this way. Uh, so what I will show you now is I will show you uh, the unit plan for critical thinking for 10 to 12. It has, um, again, uh, lots of um, a, a support resources that go with it. And there is an additional lesson, number nine, the yellow M&M experiment, a story, and it's uh, a teacher guide to use this resource. It's an interactive uh, case where students are given a situation where there's a rumor that yellow M&Ms cause dizziness and they do a scientific experiment to see if this is the case. So um, there is a workbook to go with that. And um, there are, uh, as you can see, lots of resources to go with it. Uh, so um, when you actually click on, let me see, sorry, just let me go back here. When you are on a lesson, there are the unit plans. When you click on them, it will uh, show all of them there. You can choose to uh, pick uh, different resources from different levels. These are the unit plan for the four or five. You click here to get to the printable copy that I was showing you earlier. And uh, this is an example of a literacy builder for grades four or five um, that uh, shows that they can sound out the word, they can fill in, and it, these are all age appropriate, so they're designed to build literacy, and there are, there are so many resources there that our teacher developed. Um, so I think that now what we'll do is show you how to actually go onto the site and uh, make an account for yourself. Everything is free, so hopefully um, you will, um, uh, if you're interested, you can now, this is how you would actually make a teacher account. It just takes a minute and I'll lead you through that. So here is the logged out page of Kids Boost Immunity. So Kids Boost Immunity is here, kidsboostimmunity.com. Um, if you could uh, open a tab and go to the site, and I can also copy that and put it in the chat here for you. And so you're going to be on this site and you're going to hit sign up. And when you go here, it will automatically uh, default to students. So you're going to click on teacher, student teacher, and you confirm you're a teacher. And then you're going to put in your first name and your last name and your city, province, phone number, password, and you can make it very simple uh, for today and change it later if you want to. I often put in one, two, three, four, confirm the password. 
And then uh, your email. So if you use your work email, we know right away that uh, your teachers, if you do it right now, we'll approve you right away because you're on this, this session. So we know you're a teacher and uh, you can. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, so, and then school organization and subjects, grades, and create a new account. And that's all that is required for you to actually um, actually make an account. What I'll do here, this is the this is the um, actual um, guide that has been made for this was from last year, but that's okay. Uh, this is the guide for um, you to follow if you haven't had a chance to do that here. And um, with Kids Boost Immunity, when you go onto the site and you log in, I'll log in now. Uh, sorry, there is a video there as well that you can watch that tells you about the site and what it's about. And when you log in, which I'll do now, uh, you will see you have access to all of the uh, lessons. And when you go here, it will prompt you to select a grade. So whatever grade that you are wanting to choose there, you can select, continue, and it will show you all of the different learning modules. And it will tell you the number of lessons, uh, that are available for you in that grade. So there are now over 500 lessons on Kids Boost Immunity. Uh, the critical thinking ones are here. That's, and the navigating the world of online information is there. Uh, and back to this menu here, there are my teams. If you wanna make a class, you can add, it says add a team, and I can talk a little bit about the leaderboard in a minute. You just put the, the name of your team, the school, and uh, scroll down. The main thing is to put the size and the grade, and you've created a class. So if I, uh, the main thing is you, you're going to put in a, so for here I did a, a test team for the BCTLA, and that is the teacher code that you then give the students. And once they have that and you've selected a grade and you've saved, then you will have a class and it shows up on your team. So here was one for Manitoba librarians. And uh, so that is that, the leaderboards are here. And those are when teachers have made classes and the students do the lessons and do the quizzes. And this talks about, this shows the number of questions answered and the number of students. I think that uh, I can pass along to Christy to share with you a follow-up um, document that gives you um, the links to the lessons and the links to the resources and uh, how to, to access them. So um, I should stop sharing. Let's see. There we go.